Good evening, good afternoon, hello in the present, hello in the future. My name is Victoria Vesna, direct the Art Science Center at UCLA. And I'm so happy to introduce to you the work of Mick LaRusso, who collaborated with Joel Ong. Uh, unfortunately, jo Joel is teaching right now, so he's not able to be here, but Mick will uh, tell us a little bit about their microbiome workshop. He started working with us and we started collaborating about six going on seven years ago and is an incredible artist, educator, a uh, person who really gives everything when it comes to creating teachers out of students. And that's what we try to do, to, to have students understand that what they're learning is really about how they will teach their parents, their peers, and how we can all work as a community. So a warm welcome to you, Mick, and please tell us what you prepared for us today. Thank you so much for the welcome, Victoria, and it's been a pleasure collaborating with the ArtSize Center for so many years. Uh, and in fact, Joel and I met at the ArtSize Center, um, and we, we talk a little bit about that throughout our, our uh, lecture, but um, we're, we're very much influenced by the interdisciplinary nature of the ArtSize Center and, uh, and the, the aspect of it being a hub for all these uh, mm -hmm. collaborations. And, and uh, it allowed us to uh, work with researchers at CNSI, and uh, we were also able to work with researchers at the University of Buffalo uh, in New York and um, in the Alps. I was also able to work with a number of researchers, and, and all of these, I would say, really are, are, are thanks to um, the ways in which uh, the Art Science Center networks uh, and, and connects these ideas. So, yeah. Thank that so makes much. me happy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Wonderful. So what do yeah. you have prepared for the audiences today? Yeah, so um, we're going to be presenting the Microbial Theater Workshop, which is a workshop we've presented in a number of different formats. And this is the first time we'll be presenting it uh, via YouTube and Zoom. And it's it's really a, a, a way of imagining getting into the microbial perspective. And you'll see we'll talk about that and, and uh, through different phases. Uh, understanding how to witness the world, uh, how to discover the world through the microbial perspective, and then how to perform uh, from that perspective and create stories and narratives. And so, uh, yeah, I'm happy to be presenting this. And Joel is also uh, present with us uh, via the workshop. So Wonderful. OK, so let's go to it. I'm Mick LaRusso. And I'm Joel Ong. And we are going to be presenting workshop on microbial theater based on some collaborations that we've been doing for a number of years now. So thanks to the UCLA Art Science Center for being a great hub for these interdisciplinary collaborations and idea exchanges and how we got, got started off with this, this uh, line of investigation. Our project is microbial theater, and we're gonna be doing a workshop with you um, around the microbiome. So that means all the bacteria, fungi, and viruses uh, in the environment, the body, uh, basically wherever there's life on earth, there's their microbes of some sort. Uh, and so we're gonna be um, going to look for these microbes um, and uh, developing DIY microscopy techniques, where if you have a microscope at home, then by all means use that. Um, and, uh, and using these to consider narratives that we can develop around the microbiome um, through the kind of metaphorical uh, framing of the microbiome. And, um, and although this is a recorded workshop, we hope to see some of your uh, presentations and media performances about what you find and, and imagine throughout this process. So uh, this is a really interesting article because, um, you know, of course, with with SARS and, and it, it, with SARS COVID nineteen just kind of um, uh, uh, happening to us right now, uh, we kind of think of it as a as an incident. You know, like we can actually see the the temporal uh, uh, containers of it. You know, like the first time it happened, that SARS happened, and then 
um, you know, this time it happened again, you know, and, it, you know, we, we kind of separate them as two distinct entities and we try to compare and contrast uh, the kind of environmental and cultural cultural milieus that they occurred within so that we can understand more about this. Uh, but what this article is trying to say is that these lineages, uh, viral lineages, uh, go much uh, further back uh, into a kind of um, uh, uh, paleo environment. Uh, and uh, some of the things that they're saying is, is that uh, new studies in paleo viromics point to a common ancestor for all viruses that originated and diverged genetically first in the ocean. Uh, and so there might be some uh, some revelations uh, that may be that may surface um, by studying uh, the kind of uh, uh, archaeology under under the sea. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so I think it's a really beautiful article in that it 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 brings up, up the fact that um, the ocean really does absorb the the atmospheric conditions of a certain time uh, with cold currents originating up in uh, kind of like the the poles um, they'll these cold currents will actually dip down into the deep ocean and bring whatever atmospheric information down into the ocean uh, and so the the ocean itself becomes a kind of repository of these memories uh, of of what the atmosphere was like um, including viruses right and other molecules um, and it's also uh, this really beautiful idea of of the ocean having a kind of um, consciousness or uh, ability to um, remember right and share information with us uh, throughout the, the ages so um, yeah and and I think the reason why we're starting with this site um, with this you know with this slide is really the idea that the ocean can be a kind of, of witness um, and uh, in media there is uh, John Peter's description of what witnessing kind of is, you know, there's, you know, all these different kinds of, of being a witness. I mean, and obviously it takes on a very kind of cultural and social responsibility right now. Um, but he talks about the process of witness, witnessing as one that engenders an implicit responsibility to truth. So um, over and above the institutionalization, uh, you know, in places like the courtroom where you can be a material witness, or mass media where you think about televisual uh, witnessing. The truths that uh, Peters alludes to lay hidden within the complexities of sensory experience in the way that the adverb witnessing may be preferred to viewing, listening, interpreting, or decoding in the consumption of art and other sensory media. And this is really uh, important for us because our collective project proposes um, an aesthetic component to the exploration of the microbial world um, or the creation of the quote-unquote microbial witness uh, which which we call a, a kind of quiet but powerful protagonist founded at the interstitial spaces of science art and mythology uh, and what we're interested in doing is a systematic cataloging of its umwelt uh, which we call the microbial atlas and we envision that through this artistic research process uh, we as well as our audiences uh, may also adopt a kind of ecological moral responsibility uh, that uh, kind of arises from this understanding of, of witnessing. Um, so we are, we're talking about a microbial theater, but I think one of the, the, the most recent kind of um, paradigmatic shifts in understanding of the microbiome is that, you know, we are made of uh, largely micro, micro, uh, largely bacteria, you know, they, they coexist with us uh, and a large part of us is actually uh, uh, like on a, uh, is, is actually active on a micro scale. So in a sense, you know, the, the first kind of uh, provocation we might, uh, might present is the idea that we are the microbial theater in the way that we are the site, our bodies are the site for this dramatic performing uh, of interspecies coexistence. Uh, so almost as much as we would like to think, you know, that, that we're in control and that the microbes work in our interest, uh, um, it's also likely, it's also possible that each breath that they take, um, they don't take for us, but perhaps it is they who walk through the parks, you know, in the, in the mornings, you know, whenever you do your works and evenings, mornings. Maybe it's them that senses our senses or they listen to our music or they think our thoughts. So in a sense, this workshop um, is a way for us to create our own devices for witnessing 
uh, the interactions that we may have with our microbiomes. Yeah, me? Yeah, yeah. So um, just to, to clarify what this image is, is we're really looking at different um, regions of the body and the, uh, the ways in which each region kind of has its own specific microbiome associated with it. So um, they, they are very much like forests or uh, in the, the very um, humid areas, you have kind of large microbial communities uh, of a specific type and other areas that are maybe have less contact with other um, bodies have a less diverse uh, microbiome. So, uh, And so really coming back to this idea of, of the planet itself as a witness of uh, all of these, um, all life itself. So that it really connects to um, the theory of Gaia and um, Lovelock and Margulis came up with this theory in the 70s and really came from the ability to see the planet as a whole and also uh, the fact that microbiology had advanced to the point where there was a lot more understanding of the way that, that cells were made up on the inside. And so the kind of the very small and the very large perspectives gave birth to, to this idea of the planet as a living organism that um, breathed and had a, an atmosphere that self-regulated and um, gave rise to the optimal conditions for life to flourish. So um, we're really thinking about this as um, uh, you know, the planet witnessing and also each organism on this planet witnessing the unfolding of life in this kind of dance. And so we have an image drawn by uh, Anton van Leeuwen Hook uh, in one of his early microscopes um, here on the right. And uh, of course the, the famous Apollo uh, images of the planet taken in um, the 60s and 70s were very instrumental in developing these ideas. Um, and so one of the ideas that came about that, that uh, really um, brought about this idea of the, the Gaia theory was um, endosymbiosis as well. So this idea that cells, Lynn Margulis proposed this idea that the cells that um, are in our bodies or in, in complex plants uh, are actually made up of ancient microbes that teamed up in the past. So it, symbiosis on the inside, endosymbiosis. So we have an image of mitochondria, uh, you know, the, the powerhouse of the cell, which was an, uh, a microbe that was in, at some point adapted to high oxygen levels created by um, cyanobacteria. 2.4 billion years ago. These other uh, cyanobacteria also teamed up with plant cells and became the chloroplasts uh, that we know of today. So um, this, this is also an exchange of, of gases, uh, oxygen and carbon dioxide, that is a dynamic dance that creates the atmosphere of the planet itself. So again, going back to this self-regulation of the planet as uh, the nurturer and um, a witnessing agent of life itself. The image uh, with, paired with the planet Earth earlier was a drawing that Van Leeuwenhoek made with one of his first microscopes. And this is actually what Van Leeuwenhoek's microscope looked like. It was essentially um, this uh, little contraption with, um, with some kind of screw-like bits to, for focusing. And um, the most important part is the small glass bead lens uh, that allowed him to achieve uh, magnification great enough to be able to see bacteria and what he called animalcules. You know? So this is a moment of uh, at least uh, Western society having direct observation of uh, these tiny creatures that before were really kind of um, invisible agents. So in some of our early experiments, we started doing these um, um, uh, kind of microbiome um, uh, this, uh, harvesting experiments uh, in the air. Uh, and uh, 
we kind of chanced upon a particular microbe, which we later realized was ubiquitous. You know, it's one of the most common uh, microbes around is Pseudomonas ringi uh, that existed actually in the clouds. Um, and so it, it kind of led us to think about, um, you know, early writings by a uh, mathematician, Charles Babbage, for instance, who talked about the air uh, as a never ending repository of all utterances and sound. And we started thinking about, uh, you know, perhaps genetic materials uh, and particular, particularly genetic materials of aerial microbiomes that could be uh, a kind of um, database uh, for storing uh, information and memories. Um, and so it kind of leads also to the idea that, you know, not only the ocean as a, as a kind of witness of, the, of these unfoldings, uh, but also like the clouds and the atmospheres, um, you know. With one of the things that, that really drives our project is uh, an understanding that microbes perform many, many roles. Uh, so these microbes are the, the um, Pseudomonas syringae was first studied as a plant pathogen. Uh, which is able to cause freezing in plants. Uh, they're, they're able to create ice crystals um, uh, in temperatures above uh, freezing. And, uh, but they're also, uh, you know, at first they were studied as something that was kind of negative, destroying crops. But they're also then seen as ability to create the clouds and, and to, to help seed rain. Yeah, neither, neither yeah. positive nor negative, but having kind of uh, understanding that they they perform many many functions within different ecosystems. So, mm -hmm. I mean, as an aside, um, you know, uh, Pseudomonas syringae is implicated in um, a lot of uh, conspiracy theories around weather weather modification, uh, and of course, you may know that climate geoengineering is is one of the biggest kind of plan Bs for climate action to the, today. Uh, if things don't work out, we'll just start throwing things into the atmosphere and seeding clouds so that they'll create enough of a cover to reflect sunlight back out into space. Um, that's one of the ways that uh, they're looking at it. And, and while they're not talking so much about um, uh, bacteria and in particular also, you know, the possibility of genetically engineered bacteria, um, there is a thought uh, that these uh, may be uh, one of those particles in the future uh, that may be deployed uh, on, a, on a large scale into the environment so that they can particularly affect these kind of changes in our atmosphere. Uh, so I presented a work entitled Terra Adventi, uh, which is Latin for between the, uh, between the uh, ground and the air uh, at uh, a, a number of places um, recently that, that just kind of thinks about the aesthetics of these things. So if we were able uh, to genetically modify Pseudomonas fringe um, and change certain aspects of its ice nucleation zones and change certain aspects of its DNA to encode certain levels of, of, of poetry or text that we could encrypt within there, uh, would they be able to allow us to customize clouds of the future uh, and also to customize uh, the content perhaps of rain? You know, we talked a little bit about witnessing in the microbial theater and now, you know, we're thinking also about discovery, uh, which you know, one can argue to be the central, the fundamental drive motivation for science, which is like the discovery of new uh, or the exploration of new environments and, and the discovery of new knowledges. So in that sense, uh, we were very interested to discover the microbiomes of new environments. And so we uh, looked at the skies, uh, we sent some weather balloons up uh, with some filtration hardware. Uh, we also did some workshops where we would uh, invite people to design payloads for weather balloons as well uh, that included petri dishes that would be able to sample uh, the aerial microbiomes. Uh, we also did some uh, sampling tests uh, at the Niagara. Um, I think this was the rapids before the, the actual falls on the, on the US side. Uh, so th those were interest, really interesting experiences. And, and, and Mick, would you like to share about the, uh, uh, the Alps one? Yeah, so uh, I was invited to participate in an interdisciplinary expedition to uh, the Alec Glacier in the Alps. Uh, it was the Matza expedition. And um, we w went up there and I was uh, taking samples of the aerial microbiome using kites uh, and also taking some samples of the microbiome from the glacier itself. Uh, and I and made a point of going out every day and having a kind of um, meditation on 
the the glacier itself as a kind of uh, living species being and also all the microbes that were on the glacier and kind of uh, thinking about it or meditating on it and, and simply breathing the air and speaking and sometimes even singing but uh really this idea of like how do you establish a kind of communication and this is where i mentioned before this idea that uh you know we we think of uh, van leen van hoek as the first uh, researcher in the west to have seen microbes but um it's possible that there are other ways of of observing or understanding microbes kind of on an intuitive level too right so this is kind of where it, it gets into um possible ancient cultures as well it's important to note at this point that we were uh, at the point of uh creating these um these explorations we were um, also artists in residence uh at uh coalesce center for bio arts at the university in, at buffalo that that permitted us to do some important research with um with metagenomics and mm -hmm. metataxonomics and so uh yeah Thanks to uh, Solon Morse there at the lab, he, he really guided our exploration in, in the direction of um, the really the most current research with the microbiome. And really the reason that the microbiome has become such an important topic is because of this technology. Uh, it allows you to see microbes that would not necessarily grow on an agar plate. Uh, you can take a sample from the soil, from the air, from the water, and you can, uh, amplify the DNA and uh, get a, a profile of all the species of bacteria that are present in that sample. There's a number of really important projects that have been utilizing this technology and allowing kind of this um, data crunching to occur across the world. And did you want to talk about this one, Joel? Yeah, so this is the Earth Microbiome Project, which uh, really is, is a multi-site exploration into, uh, into the microbiome. Uh, and in particular, it notes the occurrences of them and draws a, a, trace, a, you know, a line across these uh, similar occurrences in order to show a pattern of migration or movement of these microbes uh, across the Earth. Um, and, and that's all I can really say. I mean, it, it's, a, it's a fascinating graphic. Uh, um, yeah. Yeah, and I guess one other thing to, that's important to note is that they're really compares, comparing different, uh, very different parts of the world and understanding how these biomes actually share many of the, the same kind of, um, not necessarily the same species, but, but similar types of um, microbes that are fulfilling similar functions in these uh, different biomes. Uh, so it's really part of this effort to understand how the microbiome connects all of life on this planet. And um, there are a number of institutes that are looking at this and, and using the data to understand it. Um, so there's the, the EMBL in, in Europe, um, the EBI, uh, European Bioinformatics Institute. And um, here we're really looking at the fact that um, one of the, the key players in the microbiome research, of course, is the human gut, um, thinking about how that can even influence your behavior. Uh, and then going all the way into the oceans and understanding how all the creatures in the ocean are influencing each other in the, this kind of microbial soup that the ocean is. Um, and even thinking about, in the case of our research, how the ocean spray is produce, is releasing a lot of these microbes back up into the air, which also influence the formation of clouds. Um, so really, as I mentioned before, you can go to any corner of the planet and you're going to find some kind of, uh, some kind of uh, living entity, whether it's a virus, a microbe, or um, a bacteria, a virus, uh, or a protist or an archaea, um, and they're all interrelating in complex and beautiful ways. So, um, yeah, so another thing that we wanted to show is this map of the human microbiome. So, there's been a lot of research done on the human microbiome, and um, it's a beautiful rendition of one of these uh, metagenomic profiles and how many different species are involved in in the human uh, body. And this is actually kind of a trimmed version here, but um, there, there are many, many species that are uh, 
relating to each other in um, oftentimes uh, helping even the immune system signal uh, when, when pathogenic microbes are trying to kind of get a foothold. It's oftentimes the, the microbes that are part of our microbiome that actually signal the immune system. And, and oftentimes also those same microbes are performing a function of, of uh, defending their territory, if you will. And I think, you know, this, this whole zooming out into the planet, planetary kind of imagining or envisioning, uh, and then zooming back into uh, the human microbiome um, is, is a kind of real interscalar leaps that we are, we are making um, on a daily basis right now. Uh, and of course, one of the, one of the biggest uh, parts of it is, is, has to do with the imagining of um, your sphere of microbial influence uh, in a time of COVID-19, in a time of social distancing, where the six foot radius is, is kind of like the, the safe space, you know, or, but, that you have to keep from someone else in order to prevent contagion. Um, and of course, you know, this has its roots um, in, the, in, in schools of thought that include Edward Hall's uh, proxemics, and, and Hall was a, um, an American anthropologist who wanted to describe how people would behave and react in differently, uh, differently in different types of culturally defined spaces. Um, so as you can see in the diagram, uh, it's, it's basically a visualization uh, of these radiating spheres of influence from intimate space to personal space to social and public spaces. Uh, and one could think about uh, a visualization of uh, microbiome as well uh, that would be deferring within these spaces and then to see how these might actually be uh, overlapping in terms of their cultural constructs or, or their uh, geo, uh, geographical uh, constructs or, or mineral constructs even, you know, in terms of uh, d depending on what kinds of environments that you would be in. But this is definitely uh also meant to be a kind of provocation for the workshop itself and, and uh, for anybody who might be interested in going out and, and making samples um, in these different kind of spheres of influence and, and considering just like within your own home even and kind of like uh, and the space around your home or in your apartment building for example or around the house um, yeah it could be an interesting investigation um, and so we're getting into the aspect from discovery, we move into performance. Uh, and these are aspects of the, the workshop itself. Uh, when you go out and start doing your own experiments, uh, we wanted you to consider the witnessing aspect, the discovery aspect, and the performative aspect. Uh, this is a workshop, uh, or this is actually an installation that I did um, in Schopingen in 2000. 12, and this project is called Microbio Schopingen. So it's actually a model of this small German village, and uh, it consists of microbes that actually produce electricity. It's called Geobacter. Uh, and this microbe doesn't produce a lot of electricity, but it's able to, um, uh, when I hook them all up together in series and in parallel, they produce uh, the, the light for this LED that, that kind of creates a stage for shadow puppet performances. Uh, so uh, we wanted to introduce this term microperformativity, which is a term that uh, Jens Hauser uh, speaks about oftentimes, and he is a theorist based out of uh, Copenhagen, um, very instrumental in the development of bio art and um, uh, wetware. Uh, and microperformativity is really this idea that the microbes become the performers, right? Um, or we're able to kind of get into the microbial scale. Uh, but it also implies getting, uh, zooming into a, a much larger scale sometimes as well. You can get into almost like the, the galactic scale using microperformativity as well. So this is kind of what we've been talking about uh, already with uh, even the development of the Gaia hypothesis. Is there anything else you wanted to say about that, Joel? No, it's a great, it's a great word. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, so this is a drawing I did it based on a uh, scanning electron microscope image of the Geobacter metallic reducens, and this is the, uh, the star of that, that installation. They create um, this electricity using nanowires or transfer the electricity to the graphite electrodes um, using small wire-like 
protuberances from the, uh, the out, or extending outside of their cells. So, um, yeah, I'll let you talk a little bit more about this one. Yeah, so uh, some some of the early uh, installation work that we did was um, uh, were around uh, archives. I think you know we were interested in uh, the kind of cabinets, uh, window comma um, uh, aesthetics, and so we had the installation at the Gerstein Library at the University of uh, Toronto, where we uh, amass uh, some sculptural forms and some uh, scientific artifacts uh, with the intention of, of introducing a kind of microbial perspective. So we did that in the University of uh, uh, Toronto and we also did it at Biocultura in uh, Santa Fe in New Mexico. Uh, in the latest uh, installation um, that, was, uh, that was at the Nuke Gallery in California last year, we also had a series of photographs uh, and in one of them, uh, uh, we activated an, an augmented reality um, performance, if you will, of um, these three D models seen the monostringe that would float around uh, around Mick as he was med meditating at the Alps. Yeah, so um, different ways of presenting the research uh, to the public, and it, uh, you can kind of tell that we have also done quite a bit of research on the soil and the microbiome of the soil and how that interacts with the, the air and our own bodies through this process. Wow. Okay, yeah. yeah, so Jennifer Willett uh, is, has been doing a, a, a number of uh, projects with microbial or microperformativity, uh, And uh, this, this is a one that really um, inspired us because it, it's um, this idea of creating a, these Baroque stages and allowing the microbes to uh, explore the stage uh, to create their own performances in the stages on the petri dishes. Uh, and I believe that these are also uh, genetically modified. Some, some of these are genetically modified strains. Project And a friend of mine in Mexico City, uh, Gilberto Esparza, has been doing projects with um, the same bacteria, geobacter metallorudicins um, in these robots. Uh, so the robots actually go out and um, siphon up this contaminated water in, in the rivers around Mexico City. Uh, many of them are, are highly contaminated with industrial waste. And uh, the interesting thing about this, the process of the microbial fuel cell uh, with this uh, geobacter is that it helps clean out a lot of these toxins. It, um, there's even some research showing that the geobacter can sequester uh, uranium waste. Uh, and it's also a whole symbiotic environment um, with plants and technology and sensors to help this robot get to this contaminated water and produce uh, so that the bacteria can produce the electricity to allow it to move. Um, so it's really a, a post-apocalyptic scenario in a way to this idea that the, 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 the robots will be able to uh, clean up these rivers even if humans aren't around uh, to create conditions that are more ideal for uh, propagation of life. Um, and another great example here is uh, Nina Wiseman. So she's looking at the movement of microbes and then translating that into choreographed dances in public space. Uh, and so it, it's really a way of this, again, microperformativity, understanding how uh, microbes communicate and move on this small scale and, um, and then translating that into the human body so that the performers are, are, are first having this kind of tangible sense of what it is to become microbe. And then we as observers are also um, led into uh, having a better understanding of, of kind of how they sense their world and how they uh, communicate with each other. Now, I, I think it's also interesting um, that the performative process, uh, the research creation process involves kind of imagining or envisioning, uh, putting yourself in somewhat of the microbial umwelt. Uh, to try to under, begin understanding it uh, at a different scale uh, and perhaps a different uh, temporal zone as well. 
yeah, so um, Anna Dumitriou, who's also going to be uh, giving a talk in this uh, garden with UCLA, is uh, an artist who's definitely inspired a lot of our research as well. And she, she's done some projects looking at the history of um, the plague and tuberculosis. And this is a, a Victorian dress with a uh, projection map image of our video of um, the tuberculosis, the bacteria that causes tuberculosis projected on top of it and the genetic code of that same microbe projected behind the dress. Um, and so really thinking about the kind of range of visual performativity and understanding um, the relationship also to the kind of social structure of those times and the, the kind of uh, the Victorian uh, concepts of, of even beauty and um, some of these kind of aesthetic concepts came also from the influence of disease during that time, you know, so uh, she's referring to a lot of these aspects. Uh, and the family biocrest by Kathy High, and it's a friend of ours as well, and she's been doing a number of research projects on her um, own microbiome uh, and comparing it with the microbiome of uh, other individuals in her family, and, um, and also going into the De Paolo lab, uh, a collaborator for a number of years, uh, who uh, they actually started the collaboration out of the uh, UCLA Arts High Center out of a, one of the Leonardo rendezvous. Um, and so creating these kind of family biocrests, uh, looking at the, the microbes and how they influence each other in a home. Uh, and, and as an individual with Crohn's disease, understanding how um, her microbiome has shifts in it that are very contrasted to the microbiome of a healthy individual. And they're looking at the, the microbes from poop, right? So to make these comparisons. Um, and not just human poop, but also the, the um, dog poop in, in a family, in a household, and how they actually, these microbes influence each other in a home. They create a kind of microbial fingerprint of all the individuals in a home. So another really wonderful example of the microbes performing here is um, the Physerum polycephalum, which is uh, slime mold or uh, is a protist. So it's uh, not a fungi, although it's called slime mold. Uh, and it's able to form these networks very quickly. It's intelligent networks. So it's used for um, artificial, or artificial life investigations. Um, and also uh, in the Adamans Adamansky lab, really kind of thinking about how these, um, this microbial life is able to uh, solve problems very, very efficiently and quickly. Uh, so um, here we see the network of highways in the United States being formed by the slime mold uh, between these grains of uh, oats. Uh, another great example of, of kind of, um, you know, transversing uh, the the human and the microbial scale is this uh, performance workshop that she, uh, Heather Barnett, does. Uh, and the way she invites people to, um, to think about uh, navigating as a group. Um, so uh, in a way, uh, she advocates this, this uh, like being slime mole um, kind of activities that allow them to uh, self-organize in a group uh, with very simple rules um, that uh, you know algorithmically create these sense these these collective movements towards or away from uh, a, um, a, a motivation uh, a motivation. So what we're going to do in this workshop is um, learning about we've learned about the microbiome a bit now already, um, and we encourage you to do some of your own research as well. Uh, but before um, hopping directly into the workshop, but um, we also are going to be developing these stories about the microbes um, and in your own locality, or maybe you're thinking about the microbes on the world, uh, or maybe you want to create kind of more of a fictitious story. Uh, you know, it's very much up to you, but really exploring the microbial perspective, the microbial umwelt. Um, and if you really want to get into this workshop, more than just like the kind of hour that we're explaining it and um, maybe like the time it might take you to do some samplings, we highly 
encourage you to pour some aggregate plates um, and take some samples from your environment uh, and look at them under a microscope before culturing them on the agar and then also after culturing them on the agar. Um, and then if you would like to share with us after you've done some of these projects, we would love to um, see some of the videos and slideshows based on your um, microbial theaters, and microbi microbial narratives. Um, what are you gonna need for this microscope? Uh, you're, you're gonna need a microscope. Uh, so that could be a very simple microscope uh, and I'll explain how you can do that in a minute. Um, or if you have, of course, a microscope in your home already uh, or in a lab, then by all means use that. Um, you'll need some, some way of taking notes and, and, um, and a drawing pad. And um, of course your computer and glass slides are highly recommended with the cover slides so that you can really get a nice uh, thin and uh, compressed section of um, microbes under under the glass and uh, q-tips, petri dishes, uh, agar agar, sugar, and yeast-based vegetable broth, or you could use marmite, uh, basically anything where you're going to get like nutritional yeast. There's also nutritional yeast uh, capsules that you could use for the agar. Uh, food coloring and is also optional. Plaster wrap is good for covering. Uh, if you don't have petri dishes, you're using more of like recycled. Uh, glassware or containers. Um, we highly recommend that you have a gloves and mask for when you're looking at your, your samples after you've cultured them. Um, so this is where I actually I'm going to stop the screen share. So this is just a couple of really quick examples of making your own microscope. So the very one of the simplest ways of actually turning your webcam into a microscope is with a tiny lens placed directly on your computer. So I took this lens out of a laser pointer, like this very small laser pointer here. It's actually a keychain laser pointer. Um, and I removed it out of the top here. It's a pretty simple process. They cost about two, three dollars. And you can place the lens directly on your computer and use some sticky tack around the edges to kind of place it right directly onto your lens. So see the sticky tag on there? And then when I put it on the lens, you're going to see a magnified view. So it's uh, not a very high resolution microscope, not high magnification, but you can, you can see a nice view of my fingertip here. So this would be allow you to do some kind of investigations of objects up close. It would be great for looking at insects or feathers or hair, that kind of thing. You're not really going to see microbes unless they're very large microbes, which do exist. Um, and another way to make your microscope is actually this is a stage that has a um, web camera on it using just sticky tack. But the web camera, what's important to know about these web cameras is there are a lot of different web cameras on the market, but if you see uh, web cameras that kind of have like a protruding lens, you can oftentimes screw, unscrew these lenses and then just you're flipping the lens over. So this is how the lens comes originally and then you just flip it over. So that's going to give you a microscope, um, basically a quick microscope. And the further away this lens is from the, uh, from the receiver, CMOS uh, detector, then it's going to give you a higher resolution or higher magnification. So just further away means higher magnification. And um, basically what you're going to have the most challenge with in this kind of microscope is getting a base that's stable enough and also adjustable. So I've just solved it by using this, um, this kind of perf board and with some screws in each corner and you can adjust that with some bolts here. So some nuts on these bolts. So I'm able to adjust the focal length on that pretty well. Okay, so those are a couple of, of examples of DIY microscopes. There are other ones out there. If you just Google DIY microscope, you can find other ones. Um, Hacteria has a great uh, tutorials for making this kind of DIY microscope. Um, 
And, and as I said, you could also just buy a USB microscope uh, for about 20 bucks off the internet. Or there's also a really cool one called Foldscope, which also costs about $20. And it's a paper microscope. It gives you pr really high resolution, actually, because it's a small glass bead, like the original microscope. So yes, so for uh, the steps of actually making your agar, I will, will show the video uh, and cut it in probably separately here, but um, basically you're going to not have a really sterile technique when you're doing this. So uh, that's okay. We're basically just sampling the microbes in the environment anyway. So we're not gonna be necessarily isolating one strain. Um, and it's hard to identify if we don't have a lot of staining techniques and even like uh, genomic techniques to identify all, this, all the strains. Um, but uh, yeah, you can use recycled containers for your agar as well. Um, but the, the idea is to uh, kind of follow these timings. So uh, you're gonna you know, dissolve the, the agar, the sugar, and the, the yeast nutrient medium or the um, broth into uh, the, the, the kind of boiling water. And then you're going to have some time to write your questions and narratives and ideas about the microbes in your world. Uh, then you're going to pour the the agar before it's cooled down too much. It still needs to be liquid, but you don't want it to be uh, steaming. So just when it sort of stops steaming a lot, you can kind of pour it, um, and it's not going to affect if you're using um, like recycled plastic containers. Um, and you're going to be collecting some samples for based on the narratives that you create. Um, and then when you collect those samples, I we encourage you to take some of those samples to the side and then put some of them, smear some of them using a Q-tip on the agar after it's cooled for about 30 minutes. Hey everybody in SciArt. Um, so today we're gonna be making some agar. I'm gonna go over it pretty quick. It's uh, basically a kitchen recipe. All right, so today we're going to just have a cup of water or 250 milliliters of water. I've used some, um, you can use deionized water or filtered water, and you're going to need agar agar powder, you're going to need some sugar, um, and some vegetable bouillon, vegetable uh, broth that's yeast based, okay, so it, the bacteria like to eat yeast, alright, so if you don't have a scale, it's fine, you can just do a teaspoon of sugar, a teaspoon of bouillon, and a teaspoon of agar, and a cup of water. So it's boiling now, and I'm just going to give it a good stir, make sure everything's all mixed in, and then I can lower the flame. Give it another couple of nice good stirs, and let it cool. So you should let this cool for about 15 minutes before you pour it into your petri dishes or uh, recycled containers. All right, everyone, so we're ready to pour. The agar has cooled down. It's not um, scalding hot anymore, but it's still liquid. Okay, so I'm gonna use a couple of recycled containers. I have a glass container, I have a recycled plastic container. Very important with the plastic that you make sure that the agar is not steaming, that you can't see um, steam coming off of it because it will melt the plastic. So you only need about um, five millimeters, half a centimeter in there, or a quarter inch. And these, you may be making a lot of them. You may also have petri dishes. I like to use recycled things. So I have these scissors here and plastic wrap. I'm going to cut off a piece of plastic wrap. And I'll be putting a piece of plastic wrap on each container to make sure that we don't get too much contamination. From the environment, although as I said, this is not sterile method. All right, so we're just going to repeat that. So I'm going to now take some samples from the plants around here and the soil. Okay, a few fragments of soil is okay, but it'll get really dense if you um, get a whole bunch of mud on your plate, for example. But you can take. I'm going to take some of this spider web here and put it in here okay and then you're just going to continue like that taking different samples from the site and strategically placing them on the dishes 
Uh, and in order to know what your dishes are, I recommend that you go and label them. So with a uh, permanent marker, hopefully. Hey guys, we are going to look at our plates today. Remember to wear gloves and a mask. And um, I have a USB microscope that I made and slides. It's plugged into the computer already, close to getting in focus. All right, so I wanna just look at some of these samples. Let's take a look at our plates. A lot growing on them. This is Sunday, and I streaked the plates on Wednesday. Okay, so I'm just gonna take a sample off of this plate of some of this kind of bacteria that looks kind of uh, kind of wrinkly. I think that might be Actinomycetes, which is a bacteria that produces antibiotics. Okay, I'm just going to place a little bit of that on the plate here. Very, very small streak. Okay, leaving my Q-tip on the paper. And I'm going to put a little drop of iodine or deionized water, whatever you have, on the plate. Put on the cover slip. Now the cover slip, you're going to want to put that on from the edge down so you don't get bubbles. So I'll just take this, grab the edge of the drop. Now it's on there. Okay, let's take a look at what we're seeing on our computer now. Once you have your microscope close to being focused, you will get to start to see some particles of dust, hairs, and most likely you will be seeing the clusters of bacteria that you streaked on the plate. You're going to have to mess with the focus a lot to be able to see the bacteria clearly, however. All right, so that's why it's important to just kind of record in video mode and you will get some footage for sure. All right, so here we are seeing some of these bacteria. All right, have fun, good luck, and be safe. Remember to use a mask and disinfect with alcohol. You can disinfect your gloves with alcohol and wash your hands after you're done doing this. And so we wanted to share an example of um, a media art performance uh, and the kind of, this is part of the ecosynography workshop that we led in Toronto. Just going to read the excerpt that I was working from as I was gathering my samples. So the body, it sacrifices parts of itself literal parts of itself to stay alive in its core, to keep its heart beating. Fingers. Light hits Wakane, they are a tree falling, the sound of a tree falling. Toes. Light hits them, they are earth ex excavated, the sound of earth being excavated. Earlobes. Light hits Naba, they are a hurricane, the sound of a hurricane. Cheeks. Light hits Sina, they are twisted plastic in an animal's stomach, the sound of, of an animal crying. And the tip of the nose, light hits all bodies. They are poisoned water, the sound of a tap turning on, boiling water, boiling. They are all boiling. I wonder how long it takes to get to the core. Um, so when I was reading the whole play, um, I, for me it's a movement piece. Um, and I wanted to think about uh, the choreography of the space and the bodies in space. So I made two studies. One was a micro macro study of all of these natural ele elements in relationship to the parts of the body. So I took samples of a piece of a trunk, um, some plastic, a plastic fork that was in a bag in the garbage that had chicken juice on it. I took a bit of dirt. I took um, some earwax of my own, <laughs> a, a swab from inside my mouth. Uh, I put my toe on the plate. I put my fingers mm -hmm. on the plate. 
So I, I kind of combined all of these body elements and natural elements in the macro version, and then I did a micro version where I, instead of separating all these elements, I put them right on top of each other. So then I wanted to use the macro as my stage somehow, and then imagine that the micro ones are like dancers, mm. and to do a storyboard of how these bodies could move in the space throughout the whole play. So this would be like one of the storyboards. And then from there, try to figure out how that becomes 3D and becomes a physical space. This, this um, kind of explains some of the things that we would like you to integrate into your media performances. Um, so the idea is to really integrate some microscope footage. So no matter how, what magnification you have, get some kind of close up, close up uh, views of objects, or if you, if you have a high enough resolution microscope to actually see the microbes, uh, then you know, that'd, that'd be wonderful. And you could do some kind of uh, recordings of, of microbial movements and interactions, right? Um, but to really think about uh, also the mythological aspect or the metaphorical aspects of this. And in the ecosonography workshop, the metaphorical aspect was uh, came from these plays that were all about climate change. Uh, and so you know, some questions that we'd like you to consider are, how do you imagine microbes interacting and communicating? What kinds of relationships might be formed? Uh, so by that, we're, we're sort of talking about like, what's the relationship between the microbes or how, what are the relationships between uh, bodies and microbes or between an environment and microbes? And are those relationships constructive or just or destructive or both um, you know, kind of like what we're talking about even with pseudomonas syringae where it's, where it's a plant pathogen but it's also uh, demonstrated to be helping cause rain you know so uh, so I mean you know the question is what kind of narratives could you actually come up with um, and uh, for us we we did a you know a number of workshops where we we had people uh, work on these together and, and with us as well. So this is one of the, the, the narratives that we wrote um, kind of just experimentally. Um, but it, it gives us the opportunity to interface with um, other systems of knowledge, I guess, other um, uh, school of, schools of thought uh, or, or systems of or belief systems uh, that don't traditionally enter uh, the rhetoric of science. Uh, so in this particular narrative, we were interested in the North American myth uh, of the Wind Eagle, uh, who is these, um, the archetypal uh, controller of the wind or creator of the wind. Um, and uh, in this particular mythology, uh, we think about the Wind Eagle as uh, collaborating with a microbe that we, that we call Polaromonas aeolata. And they both live in the, in the wind and, and um, collaborate to to control and modify the weather. And we have a few index slides kind of looking at different types of microorganisms that exist. So like I mentioned before, archaea, bacteria, viruses, fungi, algae, um, protozoa. Uh, so this is the microbiome. Um, interestingly enough, the virus that's depicted here is, I believe, a coronavirus. <laughs> That was that predates the pandemic, though. Um, yeah, and these are, like I said, in the slides that when you want to um, actually go go to the slideshow, we we can share that on um, the art size site, hopefully. And um, yeah, different microbes that you might find on your plates. So Staphylococcus epidermis is one microbe that's very common on the skin. You might find that on your plates. Um, there's some different ways of uh, identifying that, uh, but um, if, if you're not sure, you can also just kind of um, speculate. And um, yeah, unless you have, like I said, a good microscope and staining techniques, it's oftentimes very hard to tell. E. coli, of course, a very famous microbe used in biotechnological research, and um, you are very likely to uh, find strains of that. Um, depending on where, where you're looking. Of course, it's more common in the intestine. So um, uh, it, if you're not sampling fecal matter, you're probably not gonna find E. coli. Um, and yeah, hop in here if you'd like, Joel, at any point. But uh, so actinomycetes as well. Um, 
they are uh, microbes that are also used to find um, different types of antibiotics in, in the soil. Um, so very important in current research of, because of all the superbugs that have been created from the excessive use of uh, antibiotics. Uh, so looking at, interesting enough, still looking for antibiotics, but um, uh, different strains of, uh, different types of antibiotic that can be used more specifically for specific conditions and not just like across the board like giant, you know, bombing the body with high doses of penicillin, you know. Uh, yeah, Bacillus subtilis is another a protagonist that um, you may find on your plates. And uh, it's an also really beautiful how it um, engulfs other strains. Um, I guess to the strain that's getting engulfed, it's not beautiful, but... Uh, it's uh, <laughs> some microscope imagery here showing how the Bacillus subtilis um, releases an antibiotic and, uh, and is able to uh, engulf the other strain by using this antibiotic. Um, and then we have extremophiles, which are fascinating types of microbes that exist in environments that would be extreme for us to live in, but are actually probably uh, many of the first microbes on the planet were extremophiles. Uh, so, you know, existing in ocean vents um, or places without any oxygen or extreme temperature or um, pressure. And um, this is a extremophile that can, ex that can deal with nuclear radiation, so. We have a number of resources for you as well. Uh, if you look at the slideshow. Um, highly recommend uh, Ed Yong's book, I Contain My Multitudes and Micropia, where a lot of these images came from. Um, it's a museum in the Netherlands uh, about microbes. And uh, thanks. Thank you very much, guys. It's a, yeah, I just want to say, you know, if you guys get your, um, your Petri dish set up, or you get your narrative set up, uh, your micro performances set up, and you really want to bounce some ideas off us, uh, please feel free to email us. Or if you want uh, you know, to hear from us again or join the mailing list, uh, please send an email uh, along. Be happy to hear from you. Yeah. All right. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Jen.